Uh, well, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to all those present. Uh, we have a very special guest amongst us today, tuning in from the uh, United States of America. Uh, before I formally introduce the speaker, let me say a few words about the Center for UN Studies, which is expertly spearheaded by Professor Dr. Weston Bobowski. The Center for UN Studies aims to develop a learning platform on opportunities and limits of the UN by enhancing research and building knowledge on how the United Nations systems work, both in terms of institutional development and in terms of promotion and implementation of various multilateral policies. The center fits well with the global vision and global aspirations of the Jindal Global Law School and with OP Jindal Global University, which is internationally re recognized and also revered by the likes of our speaker. The society is an offspring of the center and is a student-led initiative under the ages of the expert center and also the guidance of Professor Dr. Weston Popowski. Founded in 2020, the Society is an initiative to promote and provide a platform to young international law enthusiasts. The inaugural address and official launch of the Society was given on November 18th, 2020, and was launched by the Herbert and Rose Professor of International Law and a dear friend of the Society, Professor Jose Alvarez of New York University. Along with the Vice Chancellor, Professor Popowski, and a very dear friend, another very dear friend of the society, Dr. Mohan Kumar. Our fall lecture series of 2021, Exploring the Ecosystem of International Law, builds upon the introduction given on internationalism and international law by the concluded summer lecture series titled Future of Internationalism and International Law. The fall lecture series endeavors to study the different contours of international law. To study, to assist in the study, the speakers will cover and address their respective areas of expertise based upon the years of research and practice. Given the vast ecosystem and the engagement of international law in it, the society aims to study the fragmentation and fertilization of various disciplines in this ecosystem. The lowest common denominator in the four lecture series is to enhance and provide a deeper understanding of international law through international lawyers. The society for its members is a well of knowledge and a quorum of thought-provoking discussions. It should be the resultant of this engagement with experts aimed at studying and exploring this vast ecosystem of international law. We today, now before I finally invite our speaker, let me share the topic which we'll be speaking on. This topic is development in business and human rights law from multi-jurisdictional corporate accountability. Referred to me as a mandatory reading in my readings by my very dear and respected Professor Manika Nair. This reading, The Political Ecology of Injustice, Learning from Bhopal, offers an interesting perspective on the Bhopal gas tragedy and what Professor Bakshi in his writing reflects the four Bhopal ca catastrophes. He refers to these multinational uh, corporations as, and I quote, moral free zones and corporate Neanderthalism. He also says, and I quote, I speak of mass disaster, catastrophe, violated because the term violated gives to very state law a sense of the future of human rights. I have unlearned a lot of law and jurisprudence and struggle waged by the violated relentlessly against a powerful business governance combination. The scandalous judicial settlement by the Supreme Court of India and the labyrinth proceedings in the US courts and the utter human rightlessness have affected the struggle, voice and authorship of the violated. That is one reason why I call the saga a valiant, violated, and legal, lethal litigation, end quote. With those words, I would now like to formally uh, uh, introduce our speaker. Professor Douglas Cassell is an is, is, uh, expert and he is the uh, leader on the global law firm of King and Spalding and Emeritus Professor and uh, at uh, Notre Dame Presidential Scholar Emeritus at Notre Dame Law School. During an academic career of three decades prior to joining King and Spaulding, he taught, published, and practiced the field of international human rights law, including business and human rights. 
He is a member of the Business and Human Rights Advisory Board of the American Bar Association's Center for Human Rights and serves on the editorial board of the ABA Key Business and Human Rights Documents Project. Among his many publications in the field are State Jurisdiction over Trans Transnational Business Activity Affecting Human Rights and Research Handbook of on Human Rights and Business and outlining the case of common law duty of care of business to exercise human, human, right, human rights duties uh, due diligence in the Business and Human Rights Journal. He has both sued and defended transnational corporations and accused them of human rights abuses. So those words, I welcome Professor Cassell and hand over the floor to him. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Keith and to everyone who is joining in this uh, remote program. Uh, before I uh, give my remarks, I should clarify that I did not read uh, Professor Bakshi's uh, article uh, before I wrote these remarks. So these remarks are innocent of his comments. And here goes. Uh, nearly a half century ago, in December of 1984, a disastrous toxic leak took place at the Bhopal India chemical plant of Union Carbide, a United States company, and of U Union Carbide India Limited, its Indian subsidiary. Thousands of nearby residents perished. Hundreds of thousands may have been injured in varying degrees. A common law tort suit filed in the United States against Union Carbide was dismissed in 1986 on grounds of forum non-convenience on the condition that Union Carbide accept the civil jurisdiction of Indian courts. Later that year, the government of India, on behalf of the victims, sued Union Carbide and its subsidiary in Indian courts. In 1989, the government of India and the companies settled the suit for $470 million US, of which Union Carbide paid 425 million and its subsidiary 45 million. Although upheld by India's Supreme Court, the settlement was widely criticized as inadequate by victims, commentators, later Indian governments, and as we've just heard, by no less eminent an authority than the distinguished Indian legal scholar, Upendra Bakshi. Unfortunately, subsequent efforts in both the United States and Indian courts to reopen the claims or to add additional claims were rejected, largely on the basis that they were precluded by the settlement. The United States courts also refused to pierce the corporate veil between Union Carbide and its subsidiary. Union Carbide India Limited, they stressed, was a separate corporate entity from Union Carbide. What if Bhopal were to happen today? Would the claims against the companies be limited to ordinary common law torts, as happened 30 years ago? Or would, could claimants sue for violation of their internationally respected human rights to life and health? Would claims in the United States be dismissed on the grounds of forum non-convenience? Or suppose that Union Carbide were a U European company or a Canadian company, would forum non-convenience still be a ground for dismissal? In any of these jurisdictions, would the corporate veil between parent and subsidiary still be a defense? These are only some of the questions of law, both national and international, one, one, one might pose in the hypothetical of a Bhopal today, based on legal developments in several nations in the last five years. In many cases, in many countries, these questions are not hypothetical. Yes, transnational corporations can do much good globally by creating jobs, paying well, and contributing to economic and social development. But they also can and do inflict harm by action or omission. To cite only three recent examples from three continents, in Bangladesh, more than a thousand workers were crushed to death in the Rana Plaza collapse while producing garments for United States and European brands. In Brazil, death and devastation were caused by the collapse of the Samarco Dam, partly owned by Australia's BHP mining company. 
And in Nigeria, oil pollution, allegedly by the Shell Oil Company, has ravaged the Ogoni Delta. Developments in transnational business and human rights norms and jurisdiction in the last five years have been widespread and accelerating. But I think they are best understood in historical perspective. So if you'll permit me, we'll turn the clock back a bit. Two centuries ago, as you know, international law was called the law of nations. And that is what it was. It governed relations between nation states. It was written by nation states and for nation states. Nation states were the only subjects of international law with rare exception. That changed in the 20th century with the advent of international human rights law and international criminal law and the expansion of international humanitarian law. International law came to govern not only relations among nations, but also relations between nations and individuals. Nation states now had duties not only toward each other, but also toward their individual citizens and toward individual civilians of any nation in time of war. In addition, in wartime at least, non-state entities, such as guerrilla groups, also became subjects of international law, bound to observe Geneva Convention strictures against mistreating non-combatants and prisoners of war. But in these 20th century developments, business enterprises, even large transnational corporations were largely left out. Here and there, one could glimpse exceptions. After World War II, a few German businessmen were prosecuted for war crimes and a few German companies were sanctioned. When international law did take account of business, however, it was mainly to grant companies benefits, not duties. Under thousands of trade and investment treaties, businesses from one state could and still can bring international arbitration claims against other states, bypassing the courts. In Europe, the European Convention on Human Rights, ironically, grants human rights, mainly the rights to property and to due process of law, to companies. So when Bhopal occurred in 1984, it was treated as a mass tort, not as a matter of business and international human rights. In the 21st century, as transnational corporations became ever more dominant on the world stage in wealth and power, efforts were made to make them not just beneficiaries of international law, but duty bearers as well. In 2003, the United Nations Human Rights Council subcommission Commission Subcommission proposed a set of norms that essentially imposed the same human rights duties on business as on states. Although welcomed by many human rights organizations, this false start was roundly rejected by both governments and nearly all companies. In 2005, United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan appointed a special representative on business and human rights, Harvard political science professor John Ruggie with a mandate to study what might be done. After global consultations in 2008, Professor Ruggie proposed, and the United Nations Human Rights Council, a group of 47 states elected by the General Assembly, adopted by consensus a three-part framework, protect, respect, and remedy. Under pillar one, states have a, quote, duty to protect, unquote, human rights including from infringements by business. Under pillar two, business has a quote, responsibility to respect, end quote, human rights, by not violating human rights and by engaging in due diligence to anticipate and avoid human rights abuses. Under pillar three, both states and business should do their part to remedy abuses. States should provide both judicial and non-judicial remedies Business should cooperate in judicial mechanisms and also establish rights compatible non judicial grievance procedures. In 2011, Professor Ruggi fleshed out this basic framework with a set of 31 guiding principles on business and human rights, which were again adopted by consensus by the UN Human Rights Council. These guiding principles, the UNGPs, have since also been adopted by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, 
by regional intergovernmental organizations, by many ind industry associations, and by many individual transnational corporations. The UNGPs are not territorially bound, but they are territorially differentiated. They require states to protect against human rights abuses by business within their own territories. Beyond state borders, they instruct that states should set out clearly the expectation that their companies will respect human rights throughout their operations globally. Today, the UNGPs provide the basic rules of the road in the field of business and human rights, but they are not regarded as legally binding on business. They reflect society's expectations, but not necessarily its legal requirements. They are a condition for a company's social license to do business, but not necessarily its legal license. Given that weakness, the UN Human Rights Council in 2014 launched a process to draft a treaty to impose legally binding human rights obligations on business. Interested states, hundreds of civil society organizations, and a handful of business representatives meet every year in Geneva to discuss a treaty. Several drafts of the treaty have been produced, including the most recent one only 10 days ago, but discussions continue with no end currently in sight. That is partly because many states oppose or are at least skeptical of a business and human rights treaty. India illustrates this cautious approach. At the 2020 session of the treaty working group, India cautioned that, quote, enhanced discussion and further clarity is still required on a number of elements in the current draft text, end quote. India, add, India added that the treaty, quote, should focus only on business activities of a transnational nature and not to national enterprises, end quote, and must maintain a, quote, fine balance, unquote, between development concerns and human rights. Any treaty must be, quote, flexible and balanced, end quote. In other words, the treaty needs a lot more work before India could support it, if ever. Wholly apart from the UNGPs and the treaty process, UN human rights treaty bodies, through their general comments or their jurisprudence, advise that states parties to human rights treaties must require their companies to respect human rights, including outside the state's borders. This guidance concerns at least four treaties to which India is party. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child. However, India has not accepted the individual complaint mechanisms of any of these treaties. And even many states which do accept individual complaints before the UN committees contend that the outcomes of that process are not legally binding. What then are the promising developments in business and human rights, which I alluded to at the outset? They occur mainly in four arenas, regional organizations, national laws and court decisions, criteria used by investment managers, and trends in investor state dispute settlement. But first, a word on accountability. In a narrow sense, the word means legal accountability. For example, can a transnational corporation which violates human rights be sued? And if so, in what jurisdiction? Is a transnational corporation with a poor human rights record eligible to receive government contracts or government export incentives or import licenses? Yet in the real world of corporate decision makers, legal issues are only one aspect of accountability and not always the most important. Another vital aspect is a company's ability to attract the capital it needs to operate and expand. Globally, as of today, something like one third of all investment funds under professional management use one form or another of ESG criteria, environmental, social, and governance, which include human rights to guide investment decisions. For a company to be included in a socially responsible investment index is a carrot. To be denied eligibility for investment because of human rights issues can be a stick. 
A third aspect of accountability is reputational risk. Nowadays, a company's reputation may be harmed, for example, by media exposés, NGO human rights reports, government sanctions, legally mandated human rights disclosures, or adverse reports by an OECD national contact point. A blow to a company's reputation may cause it to lose customers, investors, talented employees, or bidding wars for public contracts. Even on the margins, such impacts can affect a company's competitive standing, market share, and quarterly profits. These three main categories of accountability, legal, financial, and reputational, are not mutually inconsistent. Often two or three may be at play in a given situation. Consider the current controversy concerning Adani, India's largest port operator and also a large mining company, over Adani's investments in a port in Myanmar and a coal project in Australia. Ever since the military coup in Myanmar this February, Adani Ports has been under pressure. Human rights groups denounce it for its contract with a Myanmar company owned by the military. Dow Jones has removed Adani Ports from its socially responsible investment index. The sovereign fund of oil-rich Norway has done likewise. In addition to these legal and fin uh, excuse me, financial and reputational risks, the company faces legal challenges. It claims that its continued investment in Myanmar does not violate United States sanctions, but human rights groups are asking the US government to rule otherwise. In Australia, Adani faces both legal and financial challenges. A lawsuit, although formally against the government, is pending to stop Adani's Carmichael coal plant. Moreover, the government is refusing to fund a rail link of nearly 200 kilometers between the mine and the port. Of course, the risk of accountability does not necessarily drive corporate decisions. Countervailing factors, such as short-term profits, expanding market share, executive stock options, and even stubbornness and pride by CEOs may cause companies to overlook or downplay their human rights responsibilities but accountability tilts the scales closer to respect for human rights. Now to some recent developments. At the regional level in Europe, the European Union is currently drafting an internal directive for its 26 member states due out this October that would impose mandatory human rights due diligence on companies. We shall see what the directive says and whether it is in fact adopted by EU member states. In Latin America, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in 2017 issued an advisory opinion on the environment and human rights. The court advised that under the American Convention on Human Rights, a state's jurisdiction extends to protect persons in other countries whose lives and physical integrity are seriously affected by the environmental impacts of the state's companies, whether operating at home or abroad. States have a duty to protect those foreign citizens and to regulate the state's companies. At the national level, legislation impo imposing duties to engage in or to report on human rights due diligence, either generally or for particular human rights, has recently been adopted in various forms in at least the US state of California in 2010, the United Kingdom in 2015, France in 2017, Australia in 2018, the Netherlands in 2020, Germany in 2021, and Norway in 2021. India has its own legislation in the field. In its remarks to the UN Working Group on a, B a Business and Human Rights Treaty last year, India stated, quote, India is one of the few countries to have statutorily mandated corporate social responsibility by law. Companies having a certain threshold turnover have been mandated by law in India to spend at least 2% of their average net profits of the preceding three years on socially beneficial activities. India's Companies Act 2013 makes a significant departure from the traditional shareholder model to the more progressive and inclusive stakeholder model. This ensures that businesses look beyond the shareholders as far as the impact of their activities on the society at large 
is concerned, end quote. These are both admirable steps, but they could go further. Corporate social responsibility philanthropy is not the same as the business responsibility to respect human rights. A stakeholder model is a welcome advance, but it should be informed by more specific provisions, such as those of the UNGPs. There have also been important recent developments in national lawsuits. Both the grounds for suing companies and the jurisdictional rules on where they may be sued have expanded in suits in the United Kingdom Supreme Court against Vedanta and Shell and against Shell in the Dutch Court of Appeals. Under this jurisprudence, it is not necessary to pierce the corporate veil. Rather than seeking to hold a parent company vicariously liable for abuses committed by its subsidiary, claimants sue the parent for its own faults, whether negligent oversight or active interference. The Vedanta case is an example. Vedanta Resources Limited is a global minerals, oil, and gas company with more than 65,000 employees and contractors primarily in India, Africa, Ireland, and Australia. Although, although formally headquartered in London, Vedanta was founded in Mumbai. Nearly all of its board and executive committee members are Indian or of Indian origin, and it has a second headquarters in India. In Africa, Vedanta operates the largest copper mine and smelter in Zambia through its majority-owned subsidiary, Concola Copper Mines PLC. Concola employs some 16,000 people. However, Concola also allegedly pollutes the only source of water for many people who live near the copper plant. A few years ago, 1,800 of them sued both Vedanta and Concola in London. Vedanta responded that it was not liable and that any claim lay only against the subsidiary, Concola. Concola claimed that English courts had no jurisdiction over it and that any claim against it could be brought only in Zambia. Both companies lost. In a jurisdictional ruling in 2019, the UK Supreme Court unanimously ruled that there was a well-arguable claim against Vedanta based on its published statements that it maintains proper standards of environmental control at the Concola mine through training, monitoring, and enforcement. The UK Supreme Court also ruled that since Vedanta could be sued in London, Concola could be brought into the suit in London as a necessary party because the claims against Concola were, quote, closely connected, end quote, to the claims against Vedanta. The Supreme Court recognized that a suit in Zambia would ordinarily be proper. However, claimants would face a real issue of access to justice in Zambia. Claimants were poor, and there is a lack of legal aid in Zambia. Moreover, said the Supreme Court, there is an, quote, absence within Zambia of sufficiently substantial and suitably experienced legal teams, end quote, for effective litigation of this size and complexity, especially against determined and well-resourced corporate defendants. Following this ruling against both companies, the parties settled the suit for an undisclosed sum. The Vedanta ruling was later followed by the UK Supreme Court and the Dutch Court of Appeals in separate cases against Royal Dutch Shell and its subsidiaries. Might the Vedanta precedent be used in India? Could both Adani and its Myanmar subsidiary, for example, be sued together in Indian courts? Is there any real chance of justice in courts in Myanmar? Recent national court jurisprudence elsewhere extends beyond common law tort suits like Vedanta. The Canadian Supreme Court in 2020 held in a suit that was later settled that there is an arguable case that companies can be sued for violating clear and universal norms of international human rights law. And even in the US, a majority of the members of the Supreme Court opined just two months ago that corporations have no immunity from suits for violating international law. Every year brings new national laws and new landmark judgments. This trend is likely to continue. Future lawyers are well advised to get ahead of these trends. Doctrines such as forum nonconvenience, the need to pierce corporate veils, and exemption of business from international human rights responsibilities 
are no longer always the formidable barriers to accountability they once were. We may, in other words, be emerging from the legal order that constrained the Bhopal settlement. Corporate privilege is also increasingly challenged in trade and investment treaties. During the late 20th and early 21st centuries, states adopted more than 3,000 mostly bilateral investment treaties, BITs, and some multilateral treaties. Most have investor state dispute settlement provisions, ISDS. Those ISDS provisions allow companies from either state party to bring international arbitration claims against the other state party, bypassing the national courts. States, by contrast, cannot bring arbitration claims against the foreign investors. Not only is ISDS thus one-sided, it allows business to bring expensive international arbitration proceedings to challenge state laws regulating human rights, such as the human rights to public health and a decent environment. A leading example is the arbitration brought by the Philip Morris Tobacco Company against Australia. The tobacco company claimed that its rights as a foreign investor were infringed by Australia's cigarette package health warning requirements. Australia eventually won the case, but only after spending some $50 million US to defend itself. After that experience, Australia announced that it would no longer enter into ISDS arbitration treaties. The human rights backlash against ISDS takes various forms. Many states, such as the European Union, Canada, and South Africa, are moving away from ISDS arbitrations altogether. Others, such as the Netherlands, now include human rights provisions in their BITs. Some arbitrators have begun to assert that investors have human rights responsibilities under international law, and international bodies are rewriting rules to make ISDS more transparent and even-handed. The trend is important for India, which is among the world's top 10 investment importing countries and top 20 investment exporting countries. India has long been ambivalent about both BITs and ISDS arbitrations. From 1994 through 2011, India signed some 85 BITs, of which 74 entered into force. But in 2017, India terminated 58 of its BITs before signing three new ones during 2018 to 2020. It appears that India's BITs from 1994 through 2019 generally included fairly typical ISDS provisions. As a result, by early this year, 25 investment arbitrations had been reportedly been brought against India, of which 11 were still pending and at least nine investment invest arbitrations have been brought by Indian companies against other states. However, arbitration awards against India may be difficult to enforce. India never joined the World Bank's ICSID Convention for the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes. That convention has been joined by 155 other states and requires states to enforce ICSID arbitration awards. India did join the New York Convention on the Recognition and, Arb and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, but did so with a commercial reservation, which the Supreme Court of India has held excludes ISDS awards from enforcement. Yet India's model BIT of 2016 retains a typical ISDS provision for arbitration of investor disputes. Two of India's three most recent BITs include ISDS provisions. Although the third with Brazil in 2020 does not, that may be due more, less to India and more to Brazil's opposition to ISDS arbitration. Whatever may be the future direction of India's policy, the global trends are clear. More and more states see ISDS as an unacceptable infringement on their sovereign right to regulate public health, the environment, and human rights. This global trend parallels the trends of increasing legislation, jurisprudence, and investor sensitivity to the human rights responsibilities of business. Many of you, perhaps most, are preparing to embark on legal careers. Whether you expect to represent companies in human rights matters or to sue them, 
professional responsibility counsels that you become familiar with these ongoing trends. In the 21st century, you cannot advise clients properly without considering factors that extend well beyond the four corners of a particular contract or legal complaint. No less important is to understand that these trends toward greater accountability do not self-generate. On the contrary, they result from the popular struggles of many people in many countries who organize and mobilize to demand change. Their struggles are invariably assisted by lawyers. As licensed attorneys, you need not be a bystander, much less an obstructionist. You will have the opportunity to contribute your legal talents to make our planet safer for human beings and for human rights. If you take that opportunity, I predict that you will find personal satisfaction in a morally rewarding career. As mentioned by Ankit Malhotra at the outset, uh, Professor Upendra Bakshi has written an important article on, um, on the Bhopal situation, and I'm told given a recent inspiring talk on Bhopal. We had hoped that he might be able to join us here today, although that proved not to be possible. We cannot all aspire to match the prophetic voice of a Professor Bakshi but we can all put our shoulders to the wheel. I encourage you all to do so. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Well, thank you so much for your quite riveting talk. And um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pity that Professor Bakshi was not able to join us, but I am sure he will be in the future. I do invite questions from our participants. We also welcome live questions. But in the interim, let me ask Professor Buck, uh, Professor Cassell the first question. I'm uh, flattered by the by your <laughs> almost mistake. I was, I was I was I was expecting that response as well. So let me let me let me share what Professor Bakshi wrote in the article. He refers to the Bhopal gas tragedy and the subsequent events as follows in a series. He classifies them as the four Bhopal gas tragedies. A claim that he makes and a claim which is extremely important uh, even in the case, even in American case which I remember reading is the DuPont case in uh, uh, West Virginia. Uh, the reference I would like to make here is the compensations received and the compensations received albeit be in a large sum but when they trickle down have very little value in terms of individual receipt. So is compensation or at least monetary compensation the uh, preferred means of uh, reparation or is some other way of uh, reparation more useful or more impactful or more valuable? Uh, well, reparations in international law take many forms and the, the, the which one is most important uh, depends on the facts of a given case. But usually, uh, uh, an optimal mix of reparations would include more than one form. Uh, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, for example, typically uh, orders uh, multiple forms of reparation in human rights suits against states. In the case of Bhopal, uh, I agree with Professor Bakshi that the amount of monetary compensation awarded was shockingly low. Uh, but other forms of reparation that might have been awarded by a court had it been permitted to do so, I don't know whether an Indian court can do this, but an inter many international courts can do, do so, would be to require uh, the creation of ongoing health monitoring for all the people who were affected uh, by Bhopal. For example, some of them may have shown the early symptoms, serious symptoms, but others may have had delayed symptoms of illnesses that would not show up for years in the future. Uh, another form of reparations would be to require uh, establishing adequate medical clinics, hospitals, uh, uh, doctors, uh, physician services uh, in the area of Bhopal for the people who live there. Uh, in some of the environmental cases, frequently the form of reparation in addition to money would be um, reclamation of the lands and the waters uh, that have been uh, adversely affected by pollution. Uh, the the, the Inter-American Court also goes beyond that to forms of moral reparations. For example, 
ordering states to make public apologies and to accept responsibility for their wrongdoing. And the same kind of thing could have been done, for example, with respect to the uh, CEO of Union Carbide or of Union Carbide India Limited or both. Uh, so there are many forms of reparations. Uh, compensation is very important. It was grossly inadequate from everything I have read in the case of Bhopal, but it is by no means the only form of reparations that should be considered in human rights cases. But I mean, I find this rather interesting because, and perhaps you can shed light on this because you've been on both sides of the spectrum. You've represented such companies, but you've also went against them. So in some sense, it is a victory in terms of defending such multinational corporations. I mean, you're still held liable, but the, but the real damage in terms of fine reputation damage is, is, is a given, but monetary loss can be, if, if curtailed is a win nonetheless in some sense. So in some sense, you have had some sort of a victory. Just after thought, I have, and I, I mean, well, a good example. Two, two possibly good examples of that. I mentioned the Vedanta case, uh, important landmark ruling by the British Supreme Court um, on the merits, on the on the legal principles. But, but the case was later settled. The question is, for how much? In the case of Bhopal, we know how much, and and it can be criticized. In the case of Vedanta, we don't know how much. And companies will often uh, say to the claimant's lawyers, look, we will settle for whatever X amount of money we ultimately agree on, provided that amount is not made public because we don't want to set a precedent and encourage other claimants. Uh, the same thing happened in the Canadian case I mentioned, where the Canadian Supreme Court in Nefson versus Araya in 2020 ruled that uh, corporations could potentially be sued directly under international human rights law. Again, that case was settled. We don't know for how much. So yes, companies, uh, if they're going to lose a case on the merits, the, what the next step they, they take is to try to hold down the amount of the settlement. Now, as counsel on business and human rights in the law firm where I am now, my responsibility is not to uh, defend the company no matter what is not to tell the company, you should just do whatever you can to get off the hook. My responsibility and my practice is to advise them as to what it seems to me is the fair and responsible thing to do. That doesn't mean they always listen to my advice, but that should be the role of a business and human rights lawyer in a company, in a, in a law firm that represents companies. Well, since you mentioned the Canadian case, I would like to share that this this lecture, which your which this the series which your lecture is a part of, was started by that lecture, and uh, we had a riveting discussion on that as well. Uh, I now invite Justin to ask his question live, and I invite others also to please share their questions, comments. Justin. Do I have to grant him access? I think I do. Yeah. Or maybe he has to unmute. Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Right. Um, thank you, Professor Castle, for your comments. As someone from Bhopal, your work means a lot. I have read your piece, uh, early works on Bhopal. So it's quite uh, nice to see you explain things um, now. I was wondering, uh, what do you think about these settlements mills, which continue to run, even though in a different format now? For my PhD with Justine Nolan at UNSW Sydney, I'm looking at the use of legal waivers in grievance mechanisms and their impact on access to remedies for victims. Companies continue to settle cases of human rights through private mechanisms now. We are shifting away from corporate accountability towards a corporate gratitude with respect to remedies. Could you please expand on how we can achieve a real corporate accountability in light of working privatization of remedial processes? Uh, thank you again. I, I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts. Thank you, uh, Justin, for the question. And you are a fortunate person to be working with Professor Justine Nolan uh, of uh, Australia, who is uh, uh, a terrific person and a great authority in the field. 
the short answer to your question about how to achieve true accountability is not easily. Uh, everything I've described that took place in the last five years took a great deal of work by a great many people. And even as I just indicated to Ankit, when you achieve a landmark judgment as happened in London and, and in, uh, mm. in Ottawa, um, you, you may have to end up settling the case. And we don't know uh, how attractive that settlement was for the, for the claimants. Um, the, the notion that companies' grievance procedures should be able to settle claims with a condition that the claimants then be precluded from going to court uh, is, uh, in my view, not compatible with human rights. It's not compatible with the criteria in UN Guiding Principle 31 for non-judicial grievance procedures by companies, which must be uh, human rights compatible and must, must not interfere with their right of access to justice. Too much of this goes on. Too much of it goes on in secret. Uh, in my personal opinion, it needs to stop. It's understandable, of course, why companies would want to do that. Uh, but it, it means, in effect, that uh, claimants are uh, under tremendous pressure uh, to take a, a small secret sum now rather than to wait until some future ju judicial proceeding where they might get a larger, fair uh, judgment. And since most of the victims in these cases are poor, they cannot afford to wait and they are under <laughs> unfair pressure, in my view, in an unequal bargaining position with a large company. Uh, and more generally, of the three pillars in the UN guiding principles, the duties of states, the responsibilities of business, and the right of victims to remedies, it seems to me that pillar three has been pretty close to an abject failure. Yes. You can say that there might have been some progress on the first two pillars, but pillar three, uh, I would pronounce a failure. 10 years after the UN guiding principles were adopted. We need something else. And that's why all of these other initiatives that I mentioned um, need to be pursued by people who are committed to uh, vindicating uh, the, the, the right of access to justice by people whose human rights have been, as uh, Professor Bakshi rightly says, violated. Thanks, Professor Kessel. Um, just to add to your point, I think, uh, or maybe not add, maybe push push you back a bit uh, on your point. Uh, your examples often are Nevsin in Canada and Ogoni Delta, uh, the Ogoni tribe, sorry, in uh, Niger Delta. Uh, but there are these cases which I'm looking at for my PhD in Tanzania, um, in Papua New Guinea, in Polgera Highlands, uh, where legal waivers were used. So, uh, so and these these waivers and these settlement mills often are perpetuated through the secretive contracts and and uh, the secretive contracts and confidentiality so there's the multiple layers of um, of challenges for victims and um, and i think i i personally think uh, we have kind of as advocates of human rights and business uh, harmonization we have kind of failed in our in our duties uh, uh, towards uh, understanding the precarious situations victims are in. So it's easy to blame the company, but um, there's also a sense of great inequality of bargaining power, and uh, which is a reflection of uh, states' failures and weak governance zones. I, I agree with you in principle. I'm not familiar in any detail with the particular cases in Tanzania or in Papua New Guinea, uh, but I would invite you, Justin, uh, to educate me, and when you have a suitable draft of your paper prepared, perhaps it already is, please send it to me and I will read it with interest. I will. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kessel. And I should be more than happy to facilitate this discussion. So, uh, I have another question in the chat box, and perhaps I'll read it out. Uh, Arudra, who's a board member of the Jindal Society of International Law, asks, what would be your response to the U.S. Supreme Court's view in Kibul that the U.S. Alien Tort Statute, which in other instances has been used for better purposes, but in this case opens the door to judicial involvement in foreign affairs, which runs the risk of destabilizing the separation of powers? 
Well, I filed an amicus brief in Keogh Bill um, arguing in support of the claimants. Um, and I happen to agree with the Keogh Bill, you may recall, was a five to four decision of the U.S. Supreme Court. And I agreed with the dissent. Uh, and I would encourage anyone who is interested in the details of the case to read not only the majority opinion with which I fervently disagree, but also the dissent by Justice Breyer that was joined by three other justices. Um, unfortunately, in the United States and in, and in some other jurisdictions, the argument that transnational uh, cases against transnational corporations can interfere with foreign affairs and therefore the courts must defer to the executive and therefore the courts must do uh, must dismiss a case uh, is one that is often raised. Uh, it is not the case that uh, foreign affairs has no relevance to these cases. Of course it does. Uh, but we have to take into consideration principles of justice. And when, uh, uh, say, an American company uh, commits wrongs in another country that harms other people and jurisdiction against that American company cannot be obtained or relief cannot be obtained against it in the foreign country, then it seems to me justice requires uh, action be taken against the uh, the U.S. company in U.S. courts, notwithstanding uh, considerations of foreign policy. Now, there was an important distinction in Keogh Bell, which is, I think, quite arguable either way, and that was that the defendant in Keogh Bell was not an American company. It was a British and Dutch company. And so the argument was made essentially, what has this got to do with the United States? Well, it had a lot to do with the United States because the Nigerian claimants had taken refuge in the United States. But setting that aside, it seems to me there's a much stronger case for suing American companies in America, US companies in the US, than there would be for suing British and Dutch companies in the US. So that was a that was a distinction that we could talk about further in terms of foreign policy. But when it comes to suing a country's own companies in its home state, uh, to me, the access to justice against such a company should override considerations of foreign policy. Well, let's let's shift fields now and let's go back to Neverson because what was shared with us and what, what I've somehow come across reading is using public international law to enforce claims against, against multinational corporations. What does this kind of a practice uh, yield to you, Professor? Because this seems like an overarching eclipsing factor which in common practice does not always have some sort of diligence to it. So is this sort of long-lasting or, or over-expanding practice useful just in order to bring a claim against uh, a multinational corporation? Yes, unfortunately the internet connection was unstable uh, but if I understand your question is it's about the role of business and human rights lawyers within law firms advising business. Um, yeah. Okay. I have, uh, before I came to uh, King and Spalding three years ago, I taught business and human rights issues at the University of Notre Dame for many years. And one of the developments that caught my attention while I was teaching was the guidelines that had been issued by the uh, International Bar Association for business lawyers concerning business and human rights. And those guidelines, which are published on the webpage of the IBA, encourage business lawyers to uh, take account of the business responsibilities of their corporate clients and also of the business responsibilities of their own law firms, which are, after all, the ones that represent big companies are typically very large um, And so my idea in coming to King and Spalding was having taught the IBA guidelines for some years, I thought I'd like to see what it's like from the inside and to try to put them into practice. And that's what I've been doing as a kind of an experiment at King and Spalding. Uh, there have been some good days and some not so good days. And um, I, uh, I, I think the jury is still out. I don't yet have, a, uh, I think, a 
a fair assessment of how useful this type of practice is. Uh, I can say that increasingly large corporate law firms that represent transnational marketing uh, practices, which they sometimes call business and human rights, they sometimes I think we've lost Professor Cassell. Uh, we will wait and hope his internet connection improves so that we can continue. I note the presence of another question. Uh, so welcome back. My apologies. I'm afraid I, I lost the connection there. I don't know if you heard it. My answer. Yes, yes we heard your answer, and uh, it, you. it does address it squarely. There's another one in the chat box, and it's uh, from an anonymous attendee. Perhaps it's from one of the new students who've joined the general cohort. Uh, they're asking a rather interesting question, which is, which is on the lines of writing and also perhaps thinking on such topics because you see this is something that i've also very recently understood the topic which you talk about dabbles in different spheres of law it's not specifically a question of human rights of environmental law of contract law it is a it is an intercourse of all these different laws so the question tries to ask you is how should one start approaching reading such issues and how should one start writing upon such issues perhaps we need another webinar for that but if you can offer a short insight on that yeah, the problem is worse than the one suggested by your uh, by your questioner uh in the area of law in order to address these cases and just the issues that i covered in my talk which are by no means all of them they involve um, international law they involve domestic constitutional law they involve private international law, public international law, comparative law, uh, contract law, administrative law, the list goes on and on. Uh, but I would, I would say the list needs to go beyond law at all. It needs to take into account uh, economics, uh, global economics. Uh, it needs to take into account sociology for questions like the one you posed on reparations. It needs to take into account history. Uh, legal cultures, national cultures. Uh, unfortunately, I think none of us has the time while we're in school uh, to study in any depth all of the subjects that are relevant. So especially for lawyers, I think it's important to get a good grounding in international law, comparative law, uh, procedural law, uh, contract law, and uh, I'm probably leaving a couple of out. And, and to read as much as you can if your educational system allows time to read beyond the field of law, the US system does, I'm not familiar with the Indian system. Uh, and then you have to do a lot of uh, continuing education, not just continuing legal education, but continuing global education once you are actually in practice. It's a challenge, uh, but I think those of you who are uh, participants in the in the uh, Jindal uh, Society of International Law who are attending talks like this one. I presume you're taking courses in the field. Uh, I think that's a good, uh, a good way to start. Perhaps Professor will also offer an internship under him. He's already offered research assistance and uh, guidance to one of our participants. So, <laughs> uh, let me, since I note no other questions, let me uh, offer my gratitude to Professor Cassell for offering his eurodite address, perhaps a tour of the force and the PS the resistance of this series, because this is some this is a topic which converges on very very intricate and very very uh, distinguished topics of international law and also public law and also national law, and it also cross cuts between jurisdictions. Professor, I hand over the floor to you for final words, and then we can close. Well, thank you very much, I'm Keith Hotra. I. I see that your law school is called Global, 
And I think in the 21st century, in a state the size of India with the impact that India has, and with the impact, frankly, that the global community has on India, uh, I think that is a, um, a very good positioning for a law school. And, and, and finally, in answer to, uh, and I commend all of you who are involved in the, these various lecture series, which are quite impressive. You have speakers from <coughs> all over the world on a range of topics. So I commend you all for that. I should finally add to my earlier answer that no one individual lawyer has to learn everything. We can't, there's too much. Uh, and that suggests the importance of finding uh, like-minded colleagues and working together in teams. Uh, I've had the privilege, for example, of working with Justine Nolan uh, on a project and with working with many other colleagues from around the world on other projects. And in, we all complain about Zoom as a result of COVID, but Zoom does have the great advantage of uh, showing us how possible it is to work together with colleagues from far distant parts of the world, even when I'm in New York, uh, haven't had breakfast yet, and you folks are uh, uh, taking up some of your Friday night uh, for a legal program, which wouldn't very often happen, frankly, in the United States. So thank you very much for this opportunity. It's been a privilege. I wish you all well. Well, I will not violate your human rights to eat any further. I thank everyone over here present. It is wonderful to see the lecture series going so well and also having a very vibrant and a wide uh, audience base and participant base. We are truly touched and we are honored to host you and we look forward to welcome you for our next lecture next week. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much.